Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, January 9th, 2019 Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. The Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 149 points, the S&P 500 up 14, the NASDAQ up 57, Russell 2000 not performing quite as well on a relative basis today, but still up seven points. 10-year Treasury yield continues to climb. Money continues to rotate away from Treasuries with the yield rising two basis points to 2.74%. Volatility was on the rise earlier today. You could see actually taking out the prior day's high for only the second time during this downtrend, but it has reversed and currently back down just below 20. Watch that level closely. Energy on the move higher. Crude oil prices continue rising. They're above $50 a barrel now. And the XLE continues pushing higher, but overhead resistance between about 62 and 64. We'll see if we can get through there. Technology. I wrote about the, this group earlier today, a little concerned because on a relative basis, we just haven't seen that strong a performance from technology on this bounce. But today we're outperforming on a relative basis. So the XLK having a nice day. Home builders continuing to strengthen. Nice breakout above that late November, early September high. Lennar. Uh, came out with earnings today. They did beat on the bottom line. They matched on the top line. Investors, though, cheering on that uh, report there. Unfortunately, they are not cheering on Constellation Brands. Uh, STZ did beat on the top line. They beat on the bottom line, but they lowered their guidance. Investors do not like to see that. Uh, you can see Digital Realty down for the same reason. They actually warned, uh, saying that their next quarter would not meet expectations. And as a result, STZ and DLR, two, uh, I last checked, they were the two worst performers in the S&P 500 today. All right, Aaron, so far, so good. Rally continues. I uh, just looked a couple minutes ago and, of course, I uh, was talking about it, the S&P 500 at 2588 near its high of the day. Yes, indeed. And I know we've been talking about that 2600 level as being pretty important. So it'll be interesting to see if we can push up even closer to that level. I mean, I've, I've been expecting it to turn down when we get there. Uh, but, you know, I, we'll see. I, I do see more rally into the end of the week, though. Yeah, for me, that first initial close, if we get it above 2581, that would be important. That was the prior close back in February of 2018. That held all year long until the December swoon that we saw. So broken support tends to serve as resistance on the way back up. We'll see whether or not we can get through that first key level. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting. And I'm waiting. The thing I've been waiting for the most is an afternoon reversal. What we've seen, what we saw yesterday was a morning uh, move back down. So, you know, kind of a little bit of maybe a warning. But I don't like to see those morning reversals. I like to see the afternoon reversals and the selling kick in into the close if, in fact, we are reversing and moving lower. So that's something maybe to keep an eye on as we go forward. Sure. And of course, we have the Fed. Yes, there you go. And if you recall, the last selling episode, or the, at least the biggest portion of that selling episode, was on December 19th when the FOMC announcement came out at 2 o'clock today. The, the minutes from that meeting come out. So is it going to be deja vu? I guess we'll wait and see. Mm -hmm. All right. We got a great guest on today, Greg Morris. You haven't been on with us in a while. We've missed you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. Always a pleasure to be on with you and Aaron. You, do, you guys do a great job. Well, thank you. And yes. I'm looking forward to you telling us exactly what's going to happen in 2019. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, laughs. he laughs at me. <laughs> Everybody laughs at me. That's all right. Um, but stick around because I know you've got a great discussion, especially, you know, with the bear market or the potential of a bear market here. Uh, I know you've got a great discussion for everybody. So uh, stick around and we'll have you back about 15 minutes or so, if that's all right, my friend. OK. Awesome. All right. Got a busy schedule here lined up, Aaron. Yes. What's going on? All right. Well, the rest of the week is still looking pretty good because we have Grace and Rose coming in tomorrow as our guest. What's hot, what's not on Friday with uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal. So that'll be fun. And then next week, Tom, you, in case you didn't know, you have a workshop on Tuesday. So, and I can guess you don't have a, a subject just yet. I just realized I have a workshop. <laughs> I figured so. 
<laughs> All right, so that should be good, whatever we turn out to do. Uh, Greg Morris, we just introduced him, of course. He'll be talking about questionable practices. So that should be an interesting presentation. 10 and 10, our first symbol will be SLV. We're gonna take a look at silver to start off the 10 and 10. And finally, we'll finish off with chart breakouts. So that should be fun. Uh, you know, we've had some upside movement here. So I know I found a couple. So it'll be interesting to share those with you. All right, but let's get started. Technical news and headlines. Tom, take it away. All right. There really wasn't anything in terms of uh, the uh, economic reports out today. I, mortgage applications come out every Wednesday. I don't really view that as a major report, so I don't talk about that too much. Um, but uh, two o'clock today, as we mentioned earlier, we will be getting the latest minutes from the last Fed meeting. So uh, that will come out at two o'clock Eastern. Whether or not it matters, I don't know. If you recall, Back at the time of the announcement, um, the Fed chair Powell was uh, pretty hawkish, uh, talking about still the fact that we were going to be looking at two more rate hikes in 2019. He has since kind of backed off of that and has been a little bit more dovish um, since then. But um, these minutes were based on what was discussed uh, back on uh, December 19th. So we'll see whether or not the, the market reacts uh, any, in any particular way but we are getting close to some key overhead resistance. And we'll talk about that more in just a bit. But first you can see the 10 year treasury yield finally seeing a little bit of life in the yield moving back up to 2.74%. Uh, we are getting close to the 20 day moving average where that has been holding. In fact, we haven't even had a test of the 20 day moving average on the way down over the past uh, seven, eight weeks or so. So let's watch that. That's at 2.76% and dropping each day. Uh, this rally is nice, but there is a question uh, at, at least in my mind, whether or not this is getting to a point where we are ready to turn back to the downside, not just with yields, but with the overall market. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit uh, more detail in just a minute. Uh, let's move on, take a look at the earnings reports. Um, let's get the slide up. Let's take a look at that first. Constellation Brands, STZ. You look at these four reports and you might say, wow, you know, what earnings slow down? Constellation Brands, Easy Beat, Lennar, pretty easy beat, Acuity Brands, MSC Industrial, all topping expectations. But if we go and take a look at Constellation Brands, for instance, let me go back to that chart, you'll see here Constellation Brands, big drop to the downside. So why the drop when you beat on earnings? Well, market looks ahead. And when you look at the report that they came out with, first of all, they did beat on the bottom line. They also beat on the top line, 1.97 billion versus 1.91 billion, but they lowered their fiscal year 19 earnings per share. So the market is, you know, these companies get, get based or their valuations are based on future earnings and earnings growth. And so when you have companies lowering those earnings going forward, you're going to have revaluations being done. And that's what we're seeing today with Constellation Brands. So headline news was great. Uh, beat on top line, beat on bottom line. Unfortunately, they're looking ahead. They're seeing weakness, very similar to what uh, Apple just talked about. Micron, I think NVIDIA and some others, FedEx. A um, lot of earnings getting ready to come out. This is gonna be a very interesting earnings season based on how the market performed in the fourth quarter. But uh, STZ uh, clearly not uh, doing well today. Lenar actually breaking out. And uh, we've been talking about the home builders. I'm going to bring this chart up and I want you to take a look at the longer term weekly chart because this breakout is, is you know, I think pretty obviously a, a, a strong tactical move here on the daily chart. We had a triple bottom in and we've gone back up now and taken out the reaction highs, which I think is a good thing. But if you look at the weekly chart, we're breaking well above the 20 week moving average. And you can see that is where we have failed in the past. So if this holds into the end of the week, this is really bullish for the group. With all these lows down here, equal lows, you can see the PPO, weekly PPO rising. I think uh, home construction has a, a run here probably to about the 750 level uh, in the cards. Pullbacks to the rising 20-week moving average is something I would watch for as a potential entry on weakness. Uh, a couple of other stocks. Let's take a look at Acuity Brands, AYI. They did beat top line. They beat on the bottom line. The stock gapped up, but has continued moving lower since gapping up off of this uptrend. That could be a very significant top on AYI unless we rally into the afternoon. MSM, the last one, 
Uh, they did come in and uh, beat top line, beat bottom line, but they guided lower in uh, their next quarter, both revenues and earnings. They gapped down, rallied back, and now back down near the low of the day. So MSM not looking very good. Skyworks, this is a semiconductor company, SWKS. They actually lowered their Q1 top and bottom line guidance, and the stock has reacted positively. But you can see this is a stock that has taken a huge hit. So it could be that a lot of it is built in. We do have a positive divergence on these recent lows. Maybe we're going to make a run for the 50. I'd be careful if we get that 50-day moving average. And then also I mentioned at the top of the show, Digital Realty Trust. They lowered their fiscal year 19 earnings per share slightly. Uh, market, though, not caring, down 6.74% breaking down currently below this double bottom. So we want to be careful. All right, I'm going to go into, I want to just give you a quick little summary of the rally that we're seeing right now in the S&P 500 and compare it historically to some of the other bear markets uh, that we've had recently. So here you've got the S&P 500 first on a 60 minute chart. I'm seeing higher prices, slightly lower PPO. And if we go back over the last three months, this is overbought during this downtrend. This is overbought. Now this would not be an overbought level in an uptrend. But during the downtrend, when we've gotten up into this area, we have seen the market turn lower. We have a negative divergence, keep that in mind. Next, the one year daily chart on the S&P. From the high in the beginning of December to the recent low, this rally is now back up just above the 50% bib level. 60% would take us up to about 26 and a quarter. So keep those levels in mind. So taking a look at this bear market rally so far, here was our breakdown. 2581 was the number from back in February. We broke below. This was the initial move down after that breakdown. Right now, we are sitting at about 10.4% on this bear market rally. Let's see how that compares to prior bear markets. We're going to go back first to the 2008. Here was the breakdown. Here was that big price breakdown. We went down. High volatility. I don't have the VIX on here. We've talked about that a lot recently. But here was the bottom. Here was the reaction high. It was 10%. We're at 10.4% right now. Going to the 2001 bear market rally. The initial, we actually had a double bottom here, but that first breakdown below these prior lows, that initial rally was back to the 20-day moving average, 9.7% before we put in that double bottom. Again, pretty close to where we are right now. Going back to 1998, now this was a cyclical bear market. This was not a secular bear market. Still, the breakdown was very swift in late August of 1998. The initial bounce, 13.7%. We went above the 20-day moving average, got into this area of price resistance, and then went back and put in a double bottom. So 13.7%, a little bit more on that rally. 1991, here was the breakdown below those prior lows. The initial rally here was only about 7% before we ended up moving lower. So I just wanted to put this bear market rally in context as we look back to, at the last four uh, initial breakdowns into bear market territory and their corresponding reaction rallies. And I think the one that we are in right now is pretty darn close to what we have seen in the past. I'm not saying we can't go higher, and in fact, I hope we do, but just keep these numbers in mind. We're getting pretty close to what we've seen in the past in terms of uh, the extent of a that initial reaction to the bear market. So with that, Aaron, I know we've got some upgrades, downgrades. What you got for us today? All righty. Let's take a peek. Uh, you know, actually, there were a ton of upgrades uh, that I can't go over, but I will read those to you at the end. But yeah, we had a, a quite a few. I thought there were some interesting ones to note. Of the interesting ones, Akamai was upgraded today. And you can see a really nice breakout from a short-term double bottom formation. And if you do the measured move here, you know, if you measure the, the height of this pattern and add it to the confirmation line, it's gonna bring you pretty much right up toward this area of overhead resistance, right around 70. And since Greg Morris is here, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw fewer trend lines. <laughs> Because I know we, we could have that discussion a long time. But anyway, I've got a lot of support and resistance showing on here. And I'm looking first to that $66 level. I think that will probably be the place that it'll turn down. I don't think it'll be able to make that full move. Uh, so even though we are seeing that upgrade, I think there's a little bit more uh, we can eke out to the upside, but I don't think you're going to get too much out of it. I do have a PMO buy signal, though, coming in. 
And, you know, if you want to compare the bottoms here from back here in October to the recent ones, we do have a positive divergence on the PMO, but I, I'm not buying it <laughs> at this point. So, all right, Bank of America also upgraded today. And we've had a PMO buy signal in place for quite a while here since uh, the end of last year. And we're now coming up to some very important overhead resistance. I, I think it's great that we got the upgrade today, um, but I'm just not seeing the kind of, um, I don't like that we're coming up to this area of overhead resistance right now. I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, financials are struggling still. Uh, you know, we might see a move up to that $27 range, uh, but I don't know that we're going to get that much off of this particular upgrade. Noble Energy also upgraded today. And you can see we had the PMO buy signal, just like on um, the other one we were looking at. Uh, it's coming in in oversold territory. We always like to see that. And we're getting that move to the upside. But again, overhead resistance is really uh, strong here because not only do we have bottoms lining up here from October and November, but if you come back, it also matches up fairly well with the February low that we saw before. So I would keep this possibly on a watch list or try and ride it out at least to that overhead resistance area. Uh, if we get the breakout, then start looking for a possibility of a move up to that $28 range. But we need to get through that overhead resistance uh, just below $24. All right, next upgrade. Actually, Nike was upgraded today and downgraded today. So I guess the question is, which one do you believe? So I was looking at the chart, and I have to say, I would, I would go with uh, the downgrade. Honestly, I think there are some positives on this chart, but we're hitting very important overhead resistance. And as you can tell, it's, you know, been it, it's got a nice touch here as far as resistance. It was resistance back here from October all the way into the beginning of December. And then you can see it also matches up with these lows we saw back in August, as well as the tops we had back here in July. So I think this will be a pretty strong area of overhead resistance. I did not draw uh, the trend lines, but I think you can see that what we have going on right now is a broadening pattern. And those are a little bit tricky. Uh, I don't like to trade when we're in a broadening pattern. So this one, I don't know that I would go after in the intermediate term. Uh, but if we get that breakout above 78, I think it could be quite interesting. Expedia, now we're looking at some downgrades here. Declining wedge uh, pattern. So instead of a broadening pattern like we saw on the other uh, chart, we have a declining wedge and those are bullish. So you want to look for that breakout to the upside. The only issue I have right now is, of course, we have an over 3% move to the downside on Expedia. Uh, we may have to come back down to that 107 level and test the bottom of the wedge one more time before we get that move or that breakout. I do have the PMO buy signal, but you can see on this move uh, down today. It has decelerated somewhat. Uh, notice that the scooter is really taking a dive right now, so I would pay attention to that as well. I will. I would look on this downgrade, like I said, possibly for a test of the bottom of this wedge and then maybe a move back up to the upside. All right, international paper. Boy, this one brings back memories of writing in uh, my accounting journals with uh, my father. We would go into barons and write down, you know, all of the uh, OBV information we needed from the newspaper looking up what the closes were back when it was eighths and three eighths. And, uh, but anyway, this one brings back memories from that period of time for me. But what I want to show you right now, we do have that PMO buy signal, but I think what's really important to uh, pay attention to is right now this overhead resistance that's up here at about $48. It matches up with these lows we've got back here from March and May. And it, it really does kind of line up here too as well with these tops that we had back in November. So I would be looking for a possible move to, the, to even test that 48 level, but you can see in the short term, uh, the lows that we had here when we were in this trading range in November, uh, that I think is going to be a problem. And you can see it already. Price did reach it. That level didn't even get all the way to $44, but it's already turning down. The PMO buy signal is positive, And of course, declining price bottoms and rising bottoms on the PMO would be considered a positive divergence. But like with some of these others, I'd need to wait for the breakout, I think, uh, watch list. 
uh, might be appropriate here for international paper. So that's all I had for the upgrades and downgrades. There you go with the list. Like I said, there were quite a few. I, I could be here all day um, reading them, but a few of interest. Advanced Auto Parts was upgraded again today. It was upgraded on Monday. Uh, Home Builders, uh, DR Horton, we were just talking about them looking pretty good. They, uh, they were um, upgraded. Lululemon, uh, MasterCard, Micron, uh, Urban Outfitters. Uh, progressive insurance. Those were all upgraded as far as our downgrades, booking, uh, Duke Energy, Estee Lauder, Five Below, uh, two airlines, United and Delta were also downgraded, Lowe's and Oracle among the other downgrades. All right, well that completes our uh, news and headlines. It's time to bring in our special guest, Greg Morris. And great to see you today, Greg. It's a pleasure, Aaron, and I was really happy to see all those horizontal trend lines you were using. I thought you would enjoy that, <laughs> and and I did draw trend lines, but they were for uh, chart patterns, so that's uh, okay. That's perfect. <laughs> I always like the horizontal ones because they're based on price, and mm -hmm. that heuristic called anchoring makes them work very well. Right, right. All right, so let's go ahead. I got your um, slides ready to go. Okay, um, uh, a little introduction here. The uh, I've been in money management. I've been a technical analyst since the early 70s, uh, and I've been everything. I've been a newbie. I've been a hobbyist. I've been an author, uh, on and on. And I think probably in the last 20 years, I would say I'm a practitioner. I actually managed money. Uh, John Murphy and I started a money management company in the late 90s. We sold it to a company in Athens, Georgia, named PMFM, later named Stadion. Uh, we used a trend following rules based model that I created for them uh, decades ago. And uh, I still use it. And uh, once the portfolio management department filled up, uh, we needed, we had a sales force all over the country, wholesalers. And we were going into the UBS and Wells Fargo and Merrill Lynch and Mutual of Omaha and Lincoln and all these and talking to advisors about our mutual funds. And, uh, after the salesmen were in there, giving them the bullet points that they're, they're given, uh, most advisors did not want to talk to salesmen anymore. They want to talk to a portfolio manager because they had very deeper probing questions that most of the sales folks couldn't answer. And so uh, there were just a couple of us in the department that could go out and give presentations. So I volunteered to become a, a salesman. And... Uh, I'd been the chief investment officer and the chairman of the investment committee and all that. I still was, but, um, so I started traveling with wholesalers and selling them on technical analysis, selling them on trend following. And I found it very difficult to do because these guys have been around a while. They'd, uh, they'd grown up and, and lived in the world of modern finance. And they'd heard that technical analysis was a black art. It was alchemy. Uh, you know, and they just had a bad rap as Wall Street has done for decades. I realized that I had to change the approach and I'm not sure when the light came on, but what I found out worked was I started telling them what was wrong with what they actually believed in. Uh, next, please. And that's kind of the uh, type of presentation I'm going to show today. It's a presentation that I used to these advisors to convince them that uh, modern finance is horribly flawed and a technical approach is considerably better. In uh, other words, I was out there selling TA. And the reason I do this for your viewers is I think many times technical analysts have a difficult time explaining what it is they do to their friends, their neighbors, their families, etc. cetera. Uh, and this will give you some uh, information and hopefully help you combat that in the future. So I'm going to give this presentation, but I'm also going to explain why I'm doing it when I'm doing it to, to the to the viewers here. So I start out by if I, I want them to be convinced that they have believed things in their life that just might not be true. Uh, for instance, I call it believable information. George Washington cut down a cherry tree. We all heard that story when we were young. Uh, George's father caught him and said, 
George, did you cut down the cherry tree? And young George said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. Well, what a fabulous story. Here's the, the founding father of our country who could not tell a lie. The problem is it isn't true. It was a story made up by Mason Weems Locke in the 1820s when he was writing a biography on Washington, trying to humanize him. Another thing, uh, Long was talking about George, is that uh, there was an old saying that George threw a silver dollar across the Potomac. Well, uh, if you've ever been to Mount Vernon, the Potomac River is about a mile wide there. And, of course, I get challenged on that, and they say, well, it didn't say he threw it across it at Mount Vernon. I said, well, they didn't have sil silver dollars back then either. Uh, bath water runs faster at the end out of a, out of a tub or a tank. And that, that's a optical illusion because when it's first beginning, you don't see the water swirling or anything. And at the end, when it's swirling, it gives you the opinion that's going down faster and it's actually going down slower. Um, I, I, <laughs> some of these are a little strange because I've got a hundred of them, but I'm trying to cover all aspects, science, uh, humanities, etc. Dogs sweat through their tongues. Dogs don't sweat. Uh, Another one I do is December 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. Most people will tell you that's the shortest day of the year. It is the shortest period of daylight, but because of Kepler's second law of planetary motion, it's actually the longest astronomical day. And I could talk for another 30 minutes about that, but I won't. So anyway, next, please. So the, the purpose of that was hopefully when I cover enough of them, was that uh, the advisor listening to that said, you know, I, I always believe that story about George Washington, and I sure didn't know that December 21st was the longest astronomical day. So I, I've, I've thrown them off, and that, that was the purpose of that part. So next. Next. So there's other types of believable information that is involved with the stock market and with investing. So I'll go through these very quickly, Aaron, you just click them as you go. Buy and hold is the only way to be successful in the market. Dollar cost averaging is a good technique. Diversification will protect you from bear markets. Compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. I'll talk about that right now. Uh, Albert Einstein is attributed with saying that. He, he, when you look it up, he actually said a few things, a few other things in addition to that to add to it. <clears throat> I say that he left out an adjective. Positive compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. You start throwing in a few negative years and things don't do, do too well. Next. Uh, for the viewers, I Erin is running the PowerPoint for me, so she's advancing the slides. That's why you keep hearing me say next. I apologize for that. I don't have the technology ability to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you must remain invested at all times. You'll miss the 10 best days of the year. I'm going to show you a chart of that. Average returns are never better than compound returns. Next. Probability and risk are the same thing. We'll talk about that quite a bit. Equity asset allocation will protect you from bear markets. Economists are good at predicting the market. I don't know if you watch the cartoon. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, CNBC. But they are constantly parading economists on the show and asking them what they think of the stock market. And here, here's, the, here's the problem I have with that. The stock market, the S&P 500, is one of the components of the index of leading indicators for the economy. So it seems like they got the, court, the cart and the horse reversed when they're asking an economist about the market. Next. Chasing performance is a common technique. Uh, that is very true and it's a very bad technique. Next. So I've got this, uh, the late Ian McAvity gave me this slide about 20 years. Ian uh, wrote Deliberations newsletter out of uh, Toronto. He died here a few years ago, and this is one of his slides he used. And I, I think I don't even have to say anything. You just need to look at it for a second. <laughs> Next. I had a day like that, by the way, Greg. <laughs> as long as you don't have two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> it's been kind of like that here in the southeast for a while. As you know. Yeah. Uh, modern finance wants you to believe that risk is volatility and that volatility is defined by a statistical term called standard deviation, which is the 
distribution of returns over time. I think that's terrible that they use that as risk. Uh, I think actual drawdown is risk. In other words, the amount that prices have gone down from a previous high in percentages. Um, a, a client will understand if he's down 50% what risk is a lot more than if you told him his standard deviation was 31. As you can see, there are a lot of drawdowns. This is the Dow back to uh, 1960. And that red line shows the percentage of drawdown. And what you can see there about 1973 at the top, it was almost 11 years, 1983, before it got back up to that red line again. So we were in a state of drawdown all of that time. And it got down to minus 45% there in 1974. So it's not just the, it's not just the drop in magnitude. It's also the duration the, this draw, this drawdown went down 45%, but it took almost 11 years to get back to even next. Uh, this is just a, a chart I have uh, in my book, investing in the trend uh, bear markets can be expected because we've had a bunch of them. These are the ones on the Dow back to uh, 1885. I, I don't use the Dow very often, except because we have actual daily data back to 1885. The S&P only goes back to 1927. And we've had 15 bear markets, and you can see all the data associated with it, decline in days, et cetera. Um, even if you left out 1929, that top one, you can see that the average drawdown is 20, 18, 22, I mean, they're all huge drawdowns, and those drawdowns can be devastating if you're a buy-hold investor. Next. Uh, so what that shows is that a 42% 40, decline requires a 72% gain to break even. That's called equivalent return math. Uh, I think everybody knows if you go down 50%, you've got to double your money to get back to even. And, and I always ask people, when's the last time you doubled your money? So uh, the, the all the purpose of this is to trying to get people to use a technical approach where, where most good technical approaches, especially trend following, you can avoid those horrible, devastating bear markets. You'll have some whipsaws along the way. I'd say whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets can be devastating. Next. Next. And this just shows uh, some more data on there. That top gray line is all the bear markets. The average duration is 1,730 days. Uh, the total duration in months and the percentage of time spent in drawdowns. Most people don't know this. When you're in a state of drawdown, and especially the ones that involved actual bear markets, they took up 73% of the entire time of the market. Next. Oh, this is uh, me just doing a little engineering work here. I don't, in fact, we can just skip this slide. This would be too uh, too much. So here's uh, the Dow Industrials. These are the annual returns back up until I haven't updated the slide in a while, but it doesn't change the message. The red are the down years. The green are the up years, and they're they're allocated. This distribution is based on deciles every 10%. And you can see that clearly it was up two thirds of the time. And if I was selling you a buy and hold strategy or wanting you to be a, inv invested in an index fund all the time, I'd say, look, the market is up two thirds of the time. And I've, I, this is, this slide is a good one because I, I tell a little story. I said, let's, let's play a game now. First of all, it's a fair game. It's an honest game. It's cost, it'll cost you $10 to play. You can play it as many times as you want. And if you win this game, you'll get a million dollars. The honest mathematical probability of winning is one time out of six, and there are no tricks. And I'm usually at an audience. I say, how many want to play? And the hands go up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I say, it's Russian roulette. How many want to play now? Well, there's always a wise guy that raises his hand, but most people are not raising their hand again uh, because they don't want to play Russian roulette because I've changed their focus from these goofy statistics 
to the risk of playing the game and the risk of playing the game in Russian roulette is death. Next. Here's the, uh, here's a slide I did on wall street wants to always have you be invested all the time. And they say, well, if you miss the 10 best days of the year, you're just going to have devastating performance and you will. That's that, that's that red line down there. And I say, well, let's just, First of all, that's a hypothetical situation. You can't begin to do that. Uh, and you can't begin to do the one I'm going to show you. But if, what if you missed the 10 worst days of the year? That's that blue line at the top. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of turning their little sales pitch around on, a, on their face at them. And then the other two lines are buy and hold. And the one of them is missing the 10 best and the 10 worst, which is basically the same as buy and hold. So what I'm doing is I'm taking something they used as a sales piece piece and throwing it back at them. Next. <laughs> oh, this is it going back. This is, this is extreme here. This, this is the same chart, but I go back to 1926 using daily data. So next. Um, <clears throat> diversification. First of all, most of us for years have always thought of diversification as a free lunch. Yes, you should be diversified. You should not put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, Gerald Loeb, a, a very famous guy back in the 50s and 60s, he, he, he said, well, he said, you can put a few eggs in that basket. Just make sure you watch that basket very close. Well, that's what you can do with technical analysis. You can watch that basket really close. But if, if, you, if you are not diversified, you're just putting yourself at a little bit greater risk, especially if you're just buying stocks, common stocks. So here's an example uh, showing you all these asset classes. These are all Vanguard mutual funds, uh, small cap, large cap, small values, emerging, European, et cetera. And you can see they're very well diversified. Next. Here are those same mutual funds uh, during the last bear market that we had, which was a bear market that included almost everything. This is why diversification will not protect you from bear markets. Uh, it'll just cause you to suffer along with everybody else while you thought you were protected. Next. Uh, compounding is eighth one of the world. We've talked about that. This, this is an example just uh, where, where you have three years of investments uh, the boring one is up 10%, up 6%, up 8%. Uh, the, the highfalutin one is up 36%. Of course, everybody's chasing performance, running into that one. Then it's up 8%, and then, whoa, you're down 20%. Down 20% isn't horrible, but it's, it's a lot. And you can see they, they averaged over three years 8%. But if you look at the compounded return, or the growth of $100, you can see that the, the good old steady positive return investment did better than the, the highfalutin 36 and minus 21 did. And then the compound return is plus 8 for the safer one and only plus 5.4 for the high volatility one. Next. So <clears throat> I talk about statistics. Uh, I think statistics are a wonderful way to learn about the markets, learn how they have performed in the past. I don't think you can use them at all going forward. And I'll give you an example. Let me take a little drink of water here. So we've all heard the story sell in May and go away. What that means is you sell your portfolio in May and buy back in November. In other words, you're out of the market for six months. Well, one of the problems with that is they, they don't tell you when to sell in May. I mean, there's 21 trading days and there's six and a half hours of trading a day. I mean, uh, you can sell in, uh, in a few seconds. So uh, they don't even tell you when you're buying back in, in November. So, and I don't know what they use for that. Probably the end of the month data, which is terrible. But let's, let's say you did some research and you went back and studied the best day of the month in May to sell and the best day in November to buy. And this worked 75% of the time, which means 75% of the time, we're not talking about how much you made, but 75% of the time, this strategy had a positive return. And we'll just leave it at that. That's not bad. 
So let's say you started using this strategy because you were convinced now these statistics are going to play out over time. You, you sell in May, you buy back in November, and at the end of the first year, gosh, you lost money. You say, well, I'll stick with this one of the bad years. Well, what if you go three or four years and they're all down, down periods? It, the reason you're not going to stick, first of all, you're not going to stick with it because you, you believe it doesn't work anymore. It still works, but you, you can't do this for a hundred years. So you won't stick with this because it works. What you forgot to remember, forgot to remember. Did I say that? Yeah. What you, what you forgot was that something that works 75% of the time is wrong 25% of the time. And you forgot about that 25% of the time it's wrong. And it doesn't say there every other year, they could come three or four years in a row. Next. So next. Okay. Well, modern port. Yeah. I'll just do some more of them. Modern portfolio theory. Uh, first of all, the, the beliefs of modern finance as started by Markowitz back in 1952 is that investors are rational. Now I want to tell you something. If you think investors are rational, you haven't been paying attention. Uh, returns are random. Well, they love the randomness because that supports using statistics and normal distributions to define everything. Well, I think you can see you during the first part of this show today, Aaron and Tom are showing trends all over the place. So that's not necessarily randomness and the returns are normally distributed. Well, they're not uh, Gaussian statistics is appropriate for use in finance investing. It, it is not. Uh, alpha and beta, which we all talk about Al alpha is the gains above a risk free and the beta is pretty much the volatility or independent of correlation. Volatility is risk. I've already talked about that. Uh, that's, they're talking about volatility as defined by standard deviation. I think drawdown is risk. Uh, next. And this, this is something that always. I don't look at earnings ever because I have this model I follow, which is kind of nice. I don't have to pay any attention to anything. Um, Wall Street is focused on forward earning estimates by the analysts. These analysts are very highly paid and they're probably wooed by the companies. I'm not, I wouldn't want to insinuate that they are, but I would, wouldn't doubt it. And so if you compare their earnings estimates with the actual reported earnings later, you'll find out that they're just horribly off a lot of time, a, a large percentage of the time. Next. So modern portfolio forgot that people trade and invest using different time horizons. Uh, some people are day traders. Some people are long-term investors. Uh, I'm a model follower follower. The model tells me when to get in and it tells me when to get out. And sometimes it's short term. Sometimes it's medium time. Sometimes uh, you need to go back. Uh, <laughs> plus everybody has different views about the markets. Uh, traders, investors all have different completely op and opposing views about what's going to happen in the market. And the other thing is using different type, different stock prices, weekly, monthly, yearly. So my, my, Harry Markowitz, I forgot his first name there, his modern portfolio theory, which is kind of the big picture of all, all the stuff, it assumes that investors ag totally agree on return, risk, and correlations of all assets and invest accordingly. So you can see what's wrong with a theory that thinks like that. There, there can't be anything positive about that theory if you think investors all think alike at the same time. If they did, the markets wouldn't work. Next. This is just shows some of the statistics. Uh, I was, uh, I was on financial news network a lot in the eighties and I was, I was watching Bill Griffith and John Bollinger on October 19th, 1987. And we had a 22 standard deviation decline. Uh, the odds of that happening are, are astronomical. Uh, you can look down there at, on line 22, 22 Sigma one time out of every nine times 10 to the hundred and third, all the stars in the universe don't come close to that number. Uh, that's an insanely giant number. And so the reason I show this is to show you how inept and how wrong it is to use Gaussian statistics 
to help you analyze the markets because we had a 22 Sigma day. Next. Uh, we, oh, this is just where I tried to put it in perspective. It's hard to put 10 to the 103rd. I talk about the speed of the light. Then I did the speed of light in miles per hour. Then I did a, the speed of light per year, uh, an equal to giant number. And so in scientific notation, it was only 5.8 times 10 to the 12th or about eight Sigma. And, and October 19th was a 22 Sigma event, just to show you how out of range and how out of whack that is with statistics. Next. Ooh, I don't see anything there. Yep. Let me try that again. Having a little bit of problems there. How's that? Nope. That's... Uh, next one. Hmm. Oh, we, 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 let's just skip that one. Okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know why I'm having such trouble. With okay, that. there there we go. Uh, risk and uncertainty. Th these are, a lot of people think these are synonymous. They, they are not. Uh, risk can be measured. Next. Risk can be measured. Uncertainty cannot be measured. Uh, back when I was an aerospace engineer in, at the University of Texas in the late 60s, we, we had some statistics courses and, and we talked about taking a jar. Well, actually, we didn't call it a jar back then. We called it an urn. That's how old that is. Uh, <laughs> took a jar. We put five red balls and five blue balls in a jar. Uh, and you said you blindly picked out a ball. What are the odds of picking out a red ball? Well, that's real simple. There are five red balls in there and there are 10 balls total. So it's five divided by 10. Or there's a 50% chance of pulling out a, a red ball. That's risk. That's a risk calculation. It's a mathematical calculation. So the, the next part is what if you were not told how many red balls or blue balls were in the jar? What are the odds of picking out a red ball? There's no way to know. That is uncertainty. And that is what the market is about. The market is totally about uncertainty. So risk is not volatility. It's drawdown loss of capital. I will admit that on a short term basis, volatility is a fairly decent proxy for risk. Uh, the more volatile it is, the more risky it is. I think that makes sense to most people. And over the long, over the long run, a drawdown is a much better measure of risk. So next. Uh, here, here's the last bear market, the blue line. Uh, it started on October 9th, 2007, and it ended in February of 2013. So that's what, six years, five and a half years, where if you were buy and hold, assuming no inflation and no dividends, et cetera, you rode that blue line all the way down and you rode it all the way back up to where it was when it started. Six years later, you had no gains in your portfolio and you're now six years older. What if you were living on, in your retirement assets and you were withdrawing 6% a year and less than just, just this for inflation, just 3%, we, we adjust it quarterly, that's the red line. So you ride this bear market down all the way a little bit further because during that time you're pulling money out and then look what happens, you're toast. You never get back to even. Um, you or you just waddle along there. You've lost 50% of your retirement money. You're still pulling out the money. You still have inflation to deal with. You still have expenses. And you're probably going to go be a Walmart greeter somewhere. <laughs> Next. So uh, this is this is almost the end of this. I'm going to go through this very quickly. The world of fine. In fact, let's skip this part and go to the next one. Okay. Next. Next. Uh, this is this is how alpha and beta is calculated. This is a linear uh, least squares fit on some data comparing a, a mutual fund against an index. Uh, this one is called ABC. And this one is fairly co correlated. You can see R squared is 0.79. Uh, modern finance likes to use R squared instead of R, which is correlation. And next, please. Now, here's here's another equity where the returns compared to the to the index are scattered all over the place. However, that least squares fit, which is a mathematical way of representing all that data with a linear line, has the exact same equation as the previous one, yet the correlation is very low. Next. 
So here's here's the overlay of the two. The, the same line represents the red dots. It also represents the blue dots. And so when you're going into uh, Morningstar or, uh, or one of these firms that shows you all these mutual funds and they show you, oh, the alpha is where it crossed the Y axis and then the beta is the slope. That's alpha and beta. That's where it comes from, those simple mathematical statistics. So if you go into Morningstar and you're looking at mutual funds and they're showing you alpha and the beta, guess what they won't show you? They won't show you the correlation. And if you don't know what the correlation is, alpha and beta are totally meaningless, as, as I could show you there, because the, that blue fund had the same comfortable returns as the red fund, and one of them was, and they were both, one was highly correlated, the other was not. So I, I think that concludes my presentation for today, Tom and Aaron. All right. Let's see. I know I did have at least one question in the chat room for you. It was very early on. I think it actually came in. Well, I think they're probably all gone now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, uh, do you prefer value or growth in 2019? Oh, uh, <clears throat> pretty general. Well, it, it is. And it's uh, I, I would I would hesitate to offer an answer there because it's been so long since I've thought along those lines. Uh, I would probably always prefer growth because I'm a trend follower because because growth will tend to do better as a trend follower than value. But like I said, I, I just follow a technical model so that I don't have to answer questions like that. I, I'm sorry that wasn't the right answer. The one answer you expected, but I'm trying to be honest about it. <laughs> Yep, it's uh, it is what it is going into 2019. That is for sure. Yes, <laughs> be very interesting. I, I would be. I, I do have opinions, uh, not based on anything other than 45 years of watching this stuff. I, I would be surprised if 2019 year wasn't a tough year. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, could 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 it be a bear market? I don't know, but I think it's just going to be a tough year. 2018 was a fairly tough year. Uh, started out wild and crazy and then had about six months of uptrends and then wild and crazy at the end. Uh, buy and hold got hurt. Trend falling was difficult. Uh, most forms of analysis were difficult. All you right. Could, well, I think yeah. this slide you definitely need to go over before we go. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, you know, everybody, I, I read all these books. Everybody has rules. And I said, well, I'll, I'll come up with some. Turn the television off. Stop surfing the internet for advice. Uh, develop a simple process, one you can explain to anyone, minus trend following. Have a process for selecting securities for your, your trend following model. I use momentum. I like things. If it's going up, I'll buy it. If it's not going up, I'm not going to guess. Uh, devise a simple set of right, reasonable rules and guidelines. These are the rules that you must have the discipline to follow. Uh, Follow your process with discipline. Without it, you will fail. It's just that simple. Discipline is the whole secret to any type of strategy. I don't care what it is. And I, I say, if you don't have the discipline, find somebody that can do it for you. Uh, don't be upset with yourself if you don't have that discipline. Uh, I tried trading commodities back in the 80s. I did not have the discipline. I, it cost me a lot of money to learn that lesson. And don't confuse luck with skill. Listen and learn from the market. It's always right. And so I couldn't come up with 10. So I said, read this list often. Oh, there you go. <laughs> How about we pull up that poll and see what people, I think All right. you gave them a hint at the beginning of your presentation. But I have one follow-up question to you on that, on your rules there, Greg. Um, and one, the one you were talking about on momentum. When you look at momentum, are you looking at it from a daily perspective, which is more short term? Or are you looking weekly, like longer term momentum? Uh, the My model is totally daily data. No enter day. I do have some weekly data that I use as overlays, kind of an environmental type thing. Is this a good investment environment or a bad investment environment? But the model is based on daily data, daily breadth, daily price, and daily relative strength. And so the selection process for ETFs is based on daily momentum. And sometimes I use a, a basket of momentum indicators. and so, Some are as simple as the 10-day rate of change. Is, is it higher than it was 10 days ago? You know, just that simple. I just I want I want to buy things that are going up. Okay. Well, I was I had a follow up question, but it sounds like you just answered it. I was wondering which momentum oscillator you you favor. But rate of change is one. I heard you say RSI. Do you look at 
uh, PPO at no, all? No, I don't. Okay. Carl wouldn't let me use it. No, I was going to say. PMO? <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you, do you use the PMO? No, I don't. Okay. I, I, it's so simple. You wouldn't believe it. People would be shocked. It's a, I use a, I use a compound momentum where I, where, where I look at the average of two or three moment, uh, m m rates of change, mm -hmm. but, uh, it's real. I was on CNBC or CNBC business, Fox business. I don't know. And, uh, Liz Clayman says, well, I see you like technology because she knew it was in my portfolio. And I said, well, not really. And she said, well, you need to explain that. And I said, well, if I own technology, it's because the technology ETF is rising in price. It is not because it's technology. Ah. In other words, I don't care what it is I'm buying. Uh, I had a, a basket of a few hundred ETFs that I could buy, and I didn't care which ones they were. I didn't buy them because what sectors they're in. I would never buy gold as an inflation hedge. I'd only buy GLD because it had been rising in price. The, the mentality there is when something is Newton's first law, if something is in motion to the upside, it probably has a good chance of continuing. And then, and of course, all, you always have stops for when it's wrong. Correct. So, yes. yep, technical analysis definitely uses prior price action, help predict future. But that's the key is keeping your stop in play, managing your risk. You bet. If you invest without stops, you're just waiting. You're, you're lucky so far. Well, one of the things you mentioned in your presentation or one of the slides showed diversification protecting you from bear markets. 82% say diversification will not protect you from bear markets. I'm going to agree with the majority here. I, I certainly will. <laughs> um, it, it will help you in periods of the, the, the daily volatility, but it, it won't protect you from bear markets. In fact, I showed that slide where all those different asset classes plummeted. Yeah, I have to say this is one, that's one word that I don't think I have ever used in my trading strategy. I'm just not a diversification yeah, yeah. Uh, advocate. All right. Well, it was certainly a pleasure having you on here. Um, I tell you, I listened to your presentation at ChartCon. It was one of my favorites because you're always, uh, not only do you give a lot of great information, but you throw in a lot of humor, which I find. <laughs> well, if you're going to. If you're going to deliver serious information, you got to get them to uncross their arms and sit there and laugh and smile with you. Well, it works because you get you Good. got them laughing a couple of times during your presentation. That was awesome. <laughs> All right. Always a pleasure to have you, Greg. We look forward to having you back soon. Thanks, Tom and Aaron. It's a pleasure. Bye. All right. Great. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right on in to the uh, 10 in 10. Um, the first stock that was being used or that was requested. Um, silver. Silver. That's it. SLV. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so let me go ahead and pull that chart up. I, I think silver, kind of like gold, and I think probably uh, Greg would, would agree, uh, we're starting to see nice uptrend. I mean, silver's been trending higher. Gold's been trending higher. Uh, even with the market strong, what's interesting, you know, we saw silver and gold start picking up when the market was weak in December. But even with the market being strong, we're not really seeing a whole lot of selling in this, which I think is a, a bullish, uh, you know, definitely a positive sign for silver. So what I've done here is I've, I've annotated the sideways consolidation off of this bottom, triple bottom that came in. We've gone back up, taken out the reaction highs from these previous lows. So I think we are now clearly uptrending. Well, at last, I don't know. Um, but getting back to some of Greg's points, if we get a pullback, we get close to a key area of support. That's where I would be getting in so I can manage my risk to the downside. But I suspect silver and gold are going higher. I look for silver to make another run back up where we saw uh, some highs earlier in 2018, maybe around 16 and a quarter, 1650. All right. The most popular in the chat room is going to be BEAT, B-E-A-T, and they would like to look at the weekly chart. Okay, we can do that. Mm-hmm. We can do anything. It's our show. Yeah. I like the daily chart, actually. Yeah, uh, the weekly chart, I don't like that negative divergence, which just tells me I, I would expect more consolidation here. I like the uptrend. So I think that the negative divergence is probably more of just a, a pause in the uptrend rather than a reversal. Uh, and I'll show you what I would be careful of in the event that it is a reversal. But there is your higher price. There is your lower uh, PPO. So clearly we have a negative divergence. We've got a, 
um, dark cloud cover candle. So you've got a reversing candle at the top with a negative divergence. That normally will lead you to a 50 period test. We almost got there. Stock was up at 75. The 50 period test, 50 week test was down at 48. Looks like we got to about 51 or so. Um, to the downside, now we've got price support just below 50 and the 50 week moving average is at 49.28. So that's what I would look for to the downside. Top side, I still think that 75 area is going to be very critical. I suspect we're going to see BEAT continue to consolidate in this wide range until that PPO works its way back down to the center line. So I wouldn't be rushing into it on the long side. Um, if you've got a long-term mentality, I'd probably be okay holding, assuming that you got in a lot lower. Um, yeah, I mean, I think overall the chart looks good. I just think that weekly negative divergence has needs some time to work its way out. All right, let's see. Next one up for you. We haven't looked at this in over a week. Mr. Softy. <laughs> All right, Mr. Softy. Love the stock. This is another one that uh, tried to make a breakout, didn't quite make it. You can see the PPO is weak. But here we have actually reset. And I think the recent lows on Microsoft probably are going to hold. I, I think Microsoft uh, performed very, very well considering the overall market. It is now, I don't think it's the number one market cap. I don't know what's going on today. I think Amazon may have passed it again. But Microsoft's been holding up very well, I think, considering the overall market. And I suspect it's going to consolidate the gains, huge gains that it's had over the past couple of years. But I suspect the next big move on Microsoft is going to be to the upside. So I like it here. I didn't annotate it. That's a problem. But I, as long as the stock holds on to its recent support, so closing basis, 98 intro week was about 94 as long as that level holds i suspect we're going to turn back up here off the center line on the ppo okay Let's see the next one is paypal pypl all right P pypl let's go back to the daily charts now uh we're getting close to some overhead resistance i think that's going to be uh important to watch i'm going to stretch the chart out here let's take a look at a year Yeah, this double, almost triple top uh, between 93 and 94. I think that's going to be the key area of resistance. PayPal looks really good to me. Um, I, I'd be a seller as I get up closer to 93 just because clearly we have some overhead resistance. That's where the sellers have come in. Um, one big positive, though, is we didn't lose any major support levels in that December sell-off on PayPal. Uh, we saw many, many areas of the market getting hit, losing support levels. PayPal just kept going sideways in the fourth quarter. So on a relative basis, held up really well, and it's not too far from a breakout. So it's hard to argue in terms of relative strength, uh, too many bearish things about PayPal. I think eventually we're going to get this breakout, but I would have to see it first. Okay, next one up. Let's see, CHK for you. Just yeah, I I think they were giving some kind of guidance earlier this morning. I saw, I don't remember what it was. Obviously the market likes it very strong volume, but it does have some overhead resistance. And so I would be maybe looking for a little pullback. Um, trying to, there was the prior uh, gap resistance. We're going through that. So that's a positive. And then the top of that candle on the bottom of these came in at about 275. So we got up to 287 earlier, currently trading 279. This is an area I wouldn't be surprised if we get a pullback, but now you've got gap support back at about 245 and the 20 day is starting to turn back up again. So this is one actually I would be coming, I, I would become a little bit more interested in so long as it can stay above that 20 day moving average. So on a pullback, it is getting a little overbought considering we've been in a downtrend. Anytime you get that RSI between 50 and 60 in a downtrend, I get a little nervous, but let's see what happens if it pulls back, if it can hold that 20 day. If it does, I think that's bullish. Okay, next one, and I thought this one was going to be a restaurant, G-R-V-Y. Uh, it isn't discretionary, but it's a toys, cra gravity company. I thought it'd be gravy. I, yeah, when you said it, I was thinking gravy. Yes, exactly. Um, I don't like yesterday's candle. Now, first of all, I would just point out, I would not trade this stock because of the illiquidity. You can see that uh, many days, this stock probably trades 10,000 shares or less. Um, and 50,000 shares, as you can see on the charts, pretty hefty 
volume. So I don't like trading these stocks because you can see really big moves when, when there is volume or even some days when there isn't that much volume. But look back to October 22nd, stock traded anywhere from $22 up to 32 and a half, closing at 27. I mean, that's the kind of action that you can get with big volume. Now, this worked, you know, to the to the uh, bullish side. But look what happened back in July when it had some volume. And we're not talking huge volume. We're just talking about relative volume on this chart. Stock here went from, what, $33, $34 down to about $23 on 200,000 shares. So I don't I just don't like I don't trust these kinds of stocks when they when you don't have liquidity if I ignore that and just simply talking about you know what's been going on here with the stock and just looking at price action I would probably keep a pretty close eye on the two bottoms that we saw back in November and December I think also there were a number of price highs recently uh, at about 37 and a half on the way up where we were struggling to get through and then finally when we broke through you could see the volume pick up so I think right in this area between 37 and a half and $40, I really wouldn't want to lose that support level going forward. Okay. Next one up is Zoomies uh, apparel retailer, Z-U-M-Z. -Z. Um, yeah, starting to strengthen off of the downtrend. That's good. Uh, volume could use a little bit more push to the upside. PPO has gone positive. So all of those things I think are good, except we could use a little bit more volume. But if the trend is going to continue to the upside, then the key for me on this chart is, again, holding that rising 20-day moving average. We started to see that earlier in 2019. And so if we get another pullback, uh, I think anything close to $20 should hold. And the $20 I'm coming up with right here, you can see that prior reaction high. We went to lower lows, had the positive divergence forming, and now we've broken out above that 20 area. I think we go back to 20 that's going to provide some pretty good price support and the rising 20-day EMA support. So that's where I would look if I was looking to enter. That's where it would be. And I'd want to see that area hold a support. Okay. Next one is our only consumer staple. And that is going to be PYX. Pi I'm not going to try. <laughs> it's tobacco. Was it Pike? Pyxis? Pyxis? I'm going to go with Pyxis. Pyxis. That sounds good. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm sure someone um, will alert us. <laughs> and you said this was tobacco? Yes. Yeah, the, the whole group, I think, struggled in the fourth quarter. Of course, the overall market struggled. But you can see the stock was $52 uh, mid-October, fell all the way down to about 11 and change. Um, I would say I could not get interested here until I at least saw a breakout above these reaction highs. So if you can get through about $16, clear the 50-day, clear these prior highs, then maybe it's got a chance to start to turn higher. I don't know what's going on with the company. I'm not really that familiar. Actually, I think we may have spoken about this one a long time ago, uh, probably back on one of the shows in October when it was having this huge run up. But um, after all the selling and all, I'd have to see this stabilization continue and then get the breakout before I'd be interested. Okay. Let's see the next one. What do you think of Intel, INTC? Yeah, semis yesterday were not doing very well, but today they're having a much better day. So I haven't looked at Intel specifically. Um, still kind of holding in this range. I mean, it, it's hard to get real excited about uh, Intel because it did decline before a lot of the other companies topping back in June and trading down. The good news, I guess, is with all the selling in December, it didn't break below the October low. But it also has had a couple of these false breakouts. You can see that long tail there taking out prior highs. And then this candle right here just kind of sitting on an island by itself. You got that island reversal off an uptrend. So I think that's going to create some overhead resistance. I think on Intel, the key areas to watch are simply that high back there and the low that we saw back in October. I think for now, we're kind of in this range from about 42 to 50. We'll see which one breaks first. PPO is sitting almost squarely on the center line, which isn't surprising when you just look at all the sideways action. I just don't see a trend here yet. Maybe that's a good thing given the overall market and how weak it's been. But I don't see any reason to, to jump in or out of Intel at this point. Okay, let's see. The last one I have for you is going to be, let's see, HL, Hecla Mining Materials. Yeah, I like uh, the recent move here, and I like that volume on the move yesterday. So, you know, I was just talking about one of the stocks a minute ago. When you get these reaction highs, you want to see a breakout, and heavy volume would certainly, you know, add to that. 
Here you can see the double bottom. We broke below it back in late October. Volume expands. And look at all of the tests of 260 before we finally made the breakout yesterday. And that is a confirming type of uh, volume right there. So I think that right now we're going to be in a range now on the stock. And I'm going to actually go up here to about 310, which was this reaction high. After moving lower, you can see we've had multiple tests up around 310. I think currently the trading range is going to be 260 to 310 on HL and a pullback down closer to 260, I think is your best reward to risk entry. So I think it's definitely improving. Uh, I don't like to chase it after it's been up the last two days. Actually, it's been up the last five or six days a lot. Uh, so I don't really want to chase it here, but a pullback I think would be very interesting. All right. And that does conclude the 10 in 10. There are the symbols that we just went over. And I will have those up in the Market Watchers Live blog. Uh, you'll find it just there. The, just click on the blogs tab and you're going to click on the Market Watchers Live blog and you'll find the link at the top or in every one of the Market Watchers recaps. All right, time for our final market update. Let's see what has been going on. I was trying to research what was going on with the Fed, but I wasn't able to find anything just yet. All right, but what's going on with the market? Uh, at this point, we are seeing a steady rise on the large cap indexes. We did pull back this morning uh, towards the open, but we have managed to move back to the upside and starting to look at new intraday highs for the NASDAQ. See mid caps also looks like they're pausing as well as the Russell 2000, but both are up today. Canadian markets having a nice rise to the upside, uh, currently up over almost 150 points. Treasury yields are higher, reading 2.728%. The VIX is moving lower. We are now looking at readings that went below 20, but currently the reading is at 20. UUP moved down really hard in the morning, but it is consolidating sideways. Currently it's sitting at 2524 and GLD is higher. We were in a downswing, but it looks like we're going to make a, a move toward intraday highs again for GLD, currently at 122.06. USO is higher on the day, up over 4.5%, currently just under $11 at 1098. And TLT moving lower, continuing the declining trend that began on Monday and currently reading at 121.07. That's all I have for the final market update. I'm going to pass back to you, Tom. Sounds good. The only thing I want to point out, and right now I think the market being above this 2581 level is certainly a short-term positive if it can hold um, where the market re you know, uh, reverses and, move and starts to move lower again is very difficult to say. And who knows? Maybe it isn't going to. Maybe this is going to end up being a V bottom. We're just going to go straight back up. I don't think that's the case. And I think for the most part, history would uh, suggest that that's not going to be the case. But uh, one thing that I would look for from a bearish perspective, if you're thinking about shorting, is uh, after watch for afternoon weakness. Watch for a tail being left above a key resistance area. So this area, 2581, right now we're above it, like I said. But if we were to reverse, leave a tail up at 2593 and have a really weak afternoon, and I'm not saying we're going to do that, just be on the lookout for it. I talked earlier about these uh, bear market um, rallies. And the current one right now for the S&P 500 is in that range of where we should be looking for a reversal. So just kind of keep an eye on that, that candle. I would be most uh, interested in a reversal that take, takes place in the afternoon. If you've seen the last couple of days when we've had pushes to the downside, they've been in the morning and then we rally throughout the rest of the day. I'd be more concerned if we got an afternoon sell off. So keep that in mind. Okay. Well, I guess it's time to move into chart breakouts. And I do have a few that I thought I would share. And I will admit that a bunch of these came off of the upgrade downgrade list, the ones that I didn't cover. So I thought there were still a few more interesting charts with uh, breakouts. So I'm gonna show you what I am seeing right now. So the first one I'm going to look at is Advanced Auto Parts. And this one was upgraded, I think I told you all, on Monday. And then it was also upgraded today. We're now finally seeing a little tiny breakout above that short-term 
resistance that we had at the 50-day EMA. I think that's very positive. Uh, that lines up with the short-term lows we had in December over here, and it also lines up with uh, the trading range that we were looking at in September and October. And given that trading range, I actually am looking for a move to test that area of overhead resistance. Now, whether it'll get past that, of course, there's always a question as to whether we would see that. I think the PMO is telling us we will. And that would mean we could see this breakout continue uh, up all the way up into that 180, 185 range. So it is an over 3% move today. Um, but I think on this breakout, I think we're pretty, we should be okay for any kind of pullback off of this rally. And if it continues to be right about here, I think that's still, I would consider it, even though we're up over 3%, I'd consider it still a tiny breakout because we did just barely get above this area of resistance. But I would look for a move certainly to that 171 area for advanced auto parts. Colgate Palmolive. All right. This one I found interesting. We already had gotten a breakout yesterday and now we're continuing up. We hit that area of overhead resistance and did manage to get above it on our intraday high. I'm noticing that now that I'm looking at this chart though, uh, right now where it is trading is below that area of overhead resistance. But again, I think you can count this as the breakout and you can see that breakout matched up right here with that low back in May and we're breaking out above an area where we saw uh, resist, well, it was support back here in November and December, back in October. So I think that is a pretty good line to look at of overhead resistance. And if we get, if we get the beat on that, I think $64, certainly where we were looking at tops back in, here in November uh, are possible. But honestly, I would be looking for a move up into that 65 range, maybe 64, 50, if we're not going to be able to continue with this kind of positive momentum. And DR Horton was another one. I always think of Horton, here's a who. <laughs> All right. So we did get a really nice breakout today. And, you know, we tested that area of resistance twice on Monday and Tuesday. Today we're getting that move. We're coming up to the 200 day EMA. So We'll have to see if that holds as some sort of overhead resistance. But you know, I've got a nice PMO buy signal. It's now reached a positive territory. Look at the improvement since November on the scooter and OBV. I like the way we're seeing these rises in this last top that we had, uh, you can see was just above the previous two that we had before. So I think this one's lining up pretty nicely. Maybe if uh, you, know, you wanna consider this, um, you, know, you could wait for that pullback and again, Personally, because people ask, are you going to run out and buy these? I'm going to say no. Um, I'm personally still in cash, so I'm not ready to dip my feet in. I think we do have a little more rally left in the short term, but I'm not so certain past that. So I'm staying out at this point. But these are some opportunities that I think you could consider, depending on your risk averse, how risk averse you are. All right. And clearly, I'm pretty uh, averse to risk. PMO is on a buy signal here for Micron. Uh, this one was also upgraded. It was upgraded twice this week as well. And I like the breakout from this overhead resistance. And now we could have a really good shot at going up to the top of this trading range that we were in in November. So that's really what I'm looking for is a move up to that uh, just above $40, maybe $41 in there. Uh, PMO buy signal and oversold territory. So I think it looks pretty good. However, 50 is below the 200. So remember, we want to expect the bearish outcomes rather than the bullish outcomes. And you can see what happened the last time we got an oversold buy signal. Uh, it just didn't, it turned into really nothing. The only difference I would say is we were at the top of this trading range that was in the process of being formed right here at that these previous support levels. And so I think the setup is different this time in that we're getting the buy signal and it's coming on a breakout. Uh, so I think we could see a move to the to that forty dollar level for sure, or forty one dollars. That's where I'd be looking, and I I should not have used the words for sure. <laughs> if I were sure about this stuff, I don't know if I'd be uh, 
doing the show with you, Tom. I really enjoy your company, but uh... <laughs> all right. So right now what I'm looking at on Tesla. Now this one, I'm going to give you a caveat in that uh, they are in some they're having some problems that came through in the news today on one of my emails that uh, they're getting, uh, I don't know if there's going to be a lawsuit or anything, but some of the batteries on one of the models, uh, when they crash, they're uh, catching fire. And so they're talking about uh, possible lawsuits and that sort of thing. So that would be my caveat here. But if you're just looking at this strictly on the technicals, uh, you got a double bottom. You've got the breakout currently holding because we are trading above that. If we closed above that, then we could really look at this as a break above the confirmation line on this double bottom. If you measure the pattern, the upside target would, wow, magically end up being that top we had in August. So this is why I love chart patterns. They really are, um, they do give you some really interesting insight. And I would say this double bottom is looking very interesting coming with a PMO that is now back in positive territory, looks like it's ready for a, a, a crossover to the upside. And those were the ones that I had to look at as far as chart breakouts. What do you have for us? All right, um, well, I did a, this kind of in a two-step process here. Um, number one, I went through all of the industry groups to see, I was not going to look at any breakouts in any industry groups that I think are just having a dead cat bounce in a bear market rally. So I'm assuming that the market is going to roll back over. So to the upside, on, the only breakouts really that I want to pay attention to are the ones that are in areas where I actually think that area is still one of the leading areas in the market. So let's first start with TSU. This is in uh, mobile telecommunications. You can see that first of all, the mobile telecommunications index, which struggled in the first half of December, has actually rallied back pretty nicely. We're not that far from a breakout above December highs. And when the rest of the market was struggling in the fourth quarter, mobile telecom was doing pretty well. So you can see the, the action there. Here, the stock is breaking out of a range versus its peers to the upside. So in addition to getting a breakout in terms of price, we're also getting a relative breakout to its peers. Um, the stock continues to perform well relative to the S&P 500 that started a few months ago. And you can see the group relative to the S&P doing well. So that's the type of stock that I would be looking at. I would not just be looking at a stock that's in a weak area that happens to be having a you know solid week. A lot of areas in the market are doing that. So you want to be careful, I think. Pulte Homes, I'm going to talk, I've been talking about home builders. I think the group has bottomed. I think we are now starting an uptrend in 2019. We'll have pullbacks along the way, but I think that the I think the home builders have bottomed. Pulte just broke out. You can see above these recent tops, nice volume on this move. I won't go through all the other charts, but trust me, with the home builders uh, picking up, I think that Pulte is one that I would certainly be interested in. Beezer Homes, another home builder just made the breakout above this reaction high at the beginning of December. So again, while the market is still just trying to get back to key areas of resistance, you've got many of the home builders breaking out to multi-month highs. I think that's encouraging. Next up, Lennar. They just reported earnings, talked about them earlier, so I won't spend a whole lot of time here. Stock is up 7% though, taking out recent highs and you can see the volume very strong. Uh, let's move on to footwear, Crocs. Now, Crocs uh, is making a breakout in the footwear space to new highs. It's not a relative high. It's an actual high. Footwear, you might look at this chart and say, well, footwear hasn't made a breakout yet. And that part is true. But Crocs is one of the best within the group. It's also wildly outperforming the S&P 500. And footwear, believe it or not, as weak as I was just showing you, it's still on a relative basis performing exceptionally well versus the S&P 500. So you've got money rotating into this area and you've got Crocs on a breakout. I like that. Uh, next up is gold, G-O-L-D. This is Royal Gold, or excuse me, Barrick Gold Corp. Uh, big gap up at the beginning of January. We're pulling back, but I like it on a pullback, especially if we get down to that 20-day moving average. You can see the uh, mine, gold miners moving higher here the past few months on an absolute basis. Obviously, that's much better than the overall market. The, the uh, Barrick Gold, relative to its peers broke out with that gap up it's been performing really well versus the s p as well and then you can see the miners also performing extremely well relative to the s p although they have pulled back on a relative basis recently with the rally 
But again, if the market rolls over, I think this is the type of stock that could continue to perform well. Uh, NGD, this is another one. Uh, in, actually, I want to go back and use that other chart. Let's stick with the uh, relative charts. But NGD, this is new gold. Uh, the breakout here, I think, is pretty obvious. We've been sideways consolidating. Huge move. Now, this is only, this is for those of you who really like these small dollar stocks, only a, a buck 14 right now. Maybe we get a, an island reversal, but if we pulled back to the 20 day, given the breakout, given what gold's been doing and the heavier volume, I would be a buyer on a pullback. Uh, VMW. Now we're going to move into the software space. Look at VMware breaking out currently. And software, yes, it's been weak. But when you look at these relative charts, VMware is one of the strongest in the software space. It is strong relative to the S&P. And believe it or not, we look at software and we say, well, it's in a downtrend. Relative to the S&P 500, it's nearing another breakout. Software, folks have not given up on this group. You might not look at, you may not see it that way when you look at the software chart, but I think when you look at these relative charts, it does paint a picture. Uh, a couple of other software, well, one other software stock, uh, Glo Globant. Uh, nice breakout today. You can see off the selling back in September, really struggled to get through 60. Now we'll want to see if it holds into the close. The other thing is the volume is 157,000 shares, so it's not a huge volume stock. Keep that in mind. But again, you're in one of the better areas of the market, and you're seeing a breakout on one of the stocks not too far from a 52-week high. So I think this one looks pretty good. And then the uh, last one I had is ELP. This is in utilities. Um, I'm not going to try and make the pronouncement there, but you can see clearly we did have a breakout after pulling back, hitting the 50-day we have rallied back to new 52-week highs. Um, if you look down here, multi, uh, the multi-utilities uh, area um, continuing to uptrend, even though it had been weak in the second half of December, it is starting to turn back up again. This stock relative to its peers has been out, you know, it's been an outperformer for four months. You can see relative to the S&P, it's been a great performer. And I think the recent pullback on a relative basis in the group is because the overall market has bounced. So this is not an area that is going to participate as much. But if the bear market rally were to end and we started moving lower, I think this is a stock where you will see money rotate back into, especially with that breakout. So those were the stocks I had. Uh, we can take a quick look at the summary here. Uh, yeah, we went over a bunch. Uh, so we gave you a bunch to, to think about there, but uh, that uh, those are, you know, and there are different ways of looking at it. I know a lot of times, Aaron, you're looking at that cross on the PMO. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that gives you a short term signal. I'm a little bit um, cautious right now because of a lot of those crosses are taking place in negative territory. So I think if the bear market kicks in, everybody just want, you know, make sure you have your stops in place. That's yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I'm not running off to, uh, pick any of these up but uh although i have to say some of those gold stocks you just presented uh i might be looking at that soon yeah i think if the market were to show a topping sign and you know we started seeing the vix picking up and the selling start to kick back in again i think that some of these gold stocks will perform really well on a relative basis and i said earlier um you know once i we saw that bear market breakdown that i was i would be a little bit more inclined to use gold or some of these gold stocks as a hedge in my portfolio. I'm not usually a gold trader, but I do think in a bad market, especially with the dollar weakening like it has over the past few months, uh, it could set up pretty nicely for some of the gold. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are about to wrap up. I will say that, uh, you know, as we're getting close to the end of the show, we do have the Dow Jones currently up near a high of the day, 176 points, and the S&P 500 currently at 2592, getting close to your 2600 level, up 18 points today. So, We'll see how we finish today. Remember, Fed minutes come out 2 o'clock, so they're going to be coming out in about uh, 30 minutes, 31 minutes. Uh, so you want to keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, again, thanks to uh, Greg Morris. Always fun to have Greg on the show. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. Uh, that's located below the video player. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everyone, and hopefully we will see you right back here tomorrow. Happy trading.